Capitola, come to the coast with me. The sun and the sky are free. We'll play in the sand and sea. Capitola, paradise you'll adore. I'll take your hand there on the sand along the shore. We are here today with Frank Perry, retiring curator of the Capitola Historical Museum. Frank has been working in museums for nearly 50 years now, since 1971. And today he's going to share with us some of his memories and some tips for creating exhibits in small museums. First of all, how did you become interested in museums? Well, it's kind of hard to say. It's just something that I've always been interested in since I was uh, really a little kid. Uh, I think it's because when I was a little kid, I liked to collect stuff. I had collections of coins and stamps and rocks and seashells and pine cones, all kinds of things. And of course, museums are the ultimate when it comes to collecting. So I think uh, perhaps it's because I liked collecting and seeing collections so much that I uh, enjoyed going to museums. Tell us about your first job in a museum. I started uh, working in a museum, a public museum, as a volunteer when I was in high school. It was between my sophomore and junior years of high school. And I uh, worked there on through high school. And then when I started to college, and by then was an adult, I was 18, uh, the museum then hired me on uh, part time. I had a job working on uh, Sundays. I was the Sunday staff person, so I would open the museum at 10 o'clock and close it at 5 o'clock and uh, do various little tasks around the museum during the day and sell things from the gift shop and so forth. So how did you learn how to do museum work? Well, I learned uh, by uh, working in museums and, and learn from the other people working in museums. These days you can uh, take courses in museum studies. There are certificates, even degrees in museum studies offered by universities. But there was very little of that back in the 1960s or 70s, or at least I wasn't aware of it. I uh, recently checked and there are, I think, 13 universities in California that have museum studies programs. So uh, it's come a long way in the past uh, 50 years. But I, I learned mostly just by doing and sort of bumbled my way along, <laughs> gradually, gradually figuring out what I was supposed to do. So what did you study in college? I was an earth sciences major at UC Santa Cruz. I, uh, at that time, was very interested in paleontology and fossils. And this was my uh, emphasis as an earth sciences major. And that gave me an opportunity to, uh, besides taking the geology classes, to also take quite a few biology classes, such as zoology and marine biology and botany. So this gave me a, a broad general background in natural history, uh, which is what I was interested in, and was, was very helpful to me later on when I started doing a lot of natural sciences exhibits on a, a freelance basis. What did you do after you graduated college? Well, for a while I continued uh, working at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History where I had started. And then I had a job for a little over a year as a curatorial assistant in the geology department at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And this was, was really exciting for me because that's, you know, the big museum in Golden Gate Park. Uh, I visited there many times uh, through the years, starting from when I was a little kid. And so it was quite exciting to work there. And, and there I was actually working with scientists who had uh, PhDs in these subjects. 
and really knew what they were doing. So I, I really learned a lot from uh, that experience. Uh, after I uh, left the California Academy of Sciences, I returned to Santa Cruz, and then I started doing uh, some work, uh, um, part-time work as an independent contractor for the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History again. And uh, it was while I was uh, working there, doing some, well, at that point, helping with exhibit projects. And it, so it was while I was there that uh, people would come around from other organizations and would ask the museum staff, do you know of anybody who could help us build an exhibit? And so I started uh, doing freelance uh, work for other organizations, other museums and schools, and a lot of things for uh, state park visitor centers. So that uh, turned into a, a business that I kept up for uh, over 30 years. Wow, so did you always want to build exhibits? And how many have you built over the years? Well, at first, the, the, a lot of the work I was doing at the, the museum when I was in high school, it was down in the basement <laughs> working on collections. And actually, I was perfectly happy to be uh, work behind the scenes on collections. Uh, I saw a lot of people come around, including uh, university students who wanted to do projects, and they all wanted to do exhibits. And so I thought, well, that's a little too trendy. I'll, I'll stick to being behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, but. I ended up uh, doing uh, a lot of I exhibits, and uh, certainly my my background in natural sciences was a, a big help. Uh, when I worked at the Academy of Sciences, I noticed this problem that existed between the scientists in the research departments and the artists in the exhibits department. A lot of the artists didn't have any science background. They had been art majors in college. And it was very difficult to communicate with the scientists when it came time to do an exhibit on some scientific topic. And so having the strong science background and later history background as well was a big help in doing uh, exhibits. Uh, I already knew at least a little bit about the subject and uh, I could talk to uh, scientists about uh, different things and usually understand what it was they were trying to uh, explain to me. Uh, with the freelance exhibits, it was great because I got to do exhibits on just so many different topics, hundreds of topics, everything from butterflies to whales to the missions to uh, Native Americans, all kinds of different uh, topics, and get to interview a lot of uh, experts to get the information to do the exhibit, and then take the uh, labels and things that I wrote, give it back to them so that they could check it over and make sure it was, uh, was accurate. Altogether, over the 30 plus years, I probably did uh, four or 500 exhibits. Wow. You seem to have shifted from natural sciences to human history. My father was not a historian or anything like that, but uh, he liked old stuff. So on vacation trips with the family, we would go to uh, historic sites such as uh, Sutter's Fort in Sacramento or Columbia State Historic Park or the Maritime Museum in San Francisco. He liked old cars and steam locomotives and stage coaches and that kind of thing. So I started, uh, when I was still quite young, uh, clipping out articles from the local newspapers and making scrapbooks of articles whenever there's one about local history. And uh, a while back, I, I checked back, and the first one I clipped out was when I was in eighth grade. So. It, it, it's an interest that goes back quite a ways. When I was in high school, I took an independent study English class when I was a junior. And for that, I did some projects on local history. And then by the time uh, I was almost done uh, with my getting my degree in Earth Sciences, I, I needed a few more credits. 
So I went back to Cabrillo College, where I had first gone to school before I transferred to UCSC. And by that time, uh, Sandy Lydon was offering his class on the history of Santa Cruz County. Well, I was just so excited to be taking this class. I'd heard some good things about it. He'd only taught it once or twice by the time I took it. And that was a real eye-opener. Not only did I get a wonderful overview of the county history from a, a professional historian who had really studied it, but I learned that studying local history uh, could be something that, that was a, a serious subject for investigation, not just this, you know, anecdotal stuff. But I, through that class, learned the tools to to do some serious uh, studies. So then when the, there were lulls in the exhibit business, I would uh, do a history project of some kind. I did several books and and some other projects on local history. How long have you been the curator here in Capitola? I uh, started eight years ago. And what are your tasks as curator? You know, in getting ready to uh, retire, I thought for the new curator, I, I better make a list <laughs> of what it is that I do. And uh, it ended up being a rather long list. I came up with 30 or 40 things, which I worried may intimidate <laughs> the new person. But most of them are pretty simple. But yeah, I, I, being that I'm the only uh, paid employee, I, I have to know how to do a little bit of everything. So uh, exhibits, uh, caring for the collections, dealing with uh, gifts and loans, uh, working with the volunteers, uh, helping the museum board with uh, the newsletter and, and other things. And uh, and a lot of it is uh, answering uh, questions from the public, uh, research, research questions. Many people who come to the museum are wanting to know uh, how they can research the history of their house in Capitola. So I uh, put together a little booklet of how to do that, which I can give them and, uh, and help them out in that way. My favorite things are doing the exhibits, but I also really, really like helping people, and especially when I can touch somebody personally and help them find out more about their own family history. That, that's really special. Recently, one of the photos that we put in the weekly feature in the newspaper uh, a woman contacted the museum. It turns out that that was her mother-in-law who was in the picture that was taken about 80 years ago. <laughs> and the family did not know about that picture, did not have a copy of that picture. So uh, I, I sent it to her and she was just so thrilled uh, to get that. And so that really made me feel really good. What is the first step in creating an exhibit? The first step, and one of the most important steps in creating an exhibit, is to choose uh, the topic. And that seems rather obvious, but it's important uh, in doing that to realize that there are some topics that are good for telling through the medium of the museum exhibit, and there are some topics that are not very good for telling that way. Uh, so you have to uh, choose the topics very carefully. Some people who are na naive and inexperienced at doing exhibits, they'll get an idea, well, I want to do an exhibit on such and such. And they start down that road and they start running into a lot of problems and difficulties and have a very difficult time uh, making it work. And, and a good example, I, I had a job many years ago of doing uh, exhibits for an organization that did uh, research on uh, ornithology, the study of birds. And the exhibits were supposed to showcase the research being done by the different uh, scientists. And one of the scientists was, uh, his topic was land bird breeding behavior. It's a little difficult to do an exhibit on behavior. <laughs> now you could these days especially have something where you, you know, push a button and see a little video of, 
of be bird behavior, but we didn't have that kind of money or that capability back then. So we settled for an exhibit of birds' nests, <laughs> which is that part. That's partly breeding behavior. It's not really what the scientists studied all that much, but. The organization already had a collection of birds' nests, and it's a nice thing that makes a display that people enjoy looking at. And uh, so, yeah, you have to, to pick the topic carefully. So I guess some exhibits require quite a bit of research then. Yeah, the, yes, the research uh, part is uh, very important. That's sort of the next step after picking the topic is to research it uh, as much as you can. And there's two facets to the research. One is to learn the subject well enough so that you can write the text for the exhibit and write the labels for the photographs or artifacts or specimens. But another part of research is finding the photographs, finding the artifacts, finding the specimens. Uh, if it's a museum that ha already has a lot of photographs and things in its collection for the exhibit, then that makes it easy. But if not, then you have to go around to uh, other institutions to see if they have some of the artifacts that you'd like to put in the exhibit or, or interesting artifacts relating to that topic, or even borrow things from uh, private collections. Do you do a lot of design work before you begin actual construction? It depends on uh, the project. When I was doing this on a freelance basis, then I had to do a lot more design work because I wanted to get approval of the client before I actually started building the exhibit. I didn't want to start building something and then have them say, no, 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 that's, that's not what I want. <laughs> that would not be good. So I would make very detailed uh, drawings, or in some case even do uh, models. Uh, sometimes I did a, a, a mock-up of an entire room, if it was, say, a, a visitor center, with little, little replicas of what the different exhibits would look like and where they'd be in the room. Not real detailed, but just enough so I and the client could get a sense of what this was going to look like and, and make sure it was uh, what they wanted. So uh, that was when I was working on a freelance basis. At the Capitol Historical Museum, since I'm the curator and I'm not only doing the exhibits but I'm also the client, I have the luxury of not having to do real detailed drawings of what the exhibits are going to look like. Uh, a lot of it's in my head because I've done so many, I, I kind of can work out a lot of stuff in my head. And I just make very simple sketches. Uh, the museum is laid out in such a way that we have all these separate permanent display cases and wall spaces. So each exhibition has to be broken up into about 20 little exhibits. So I design each of those little exhibits. Uh, they're all uh, subjects that fit the theme, the overall theme of the exhibition. And we have the, the luxury that the, or I have the luxury that we just close the museum for a couple of months in the winter time when there aren't very many visitors. So I get to lay, do the final layout of the exhibits full size in the display cases. I don't have to do models or make detailed drawings. So I make little cutouts for the photographs of what size I think each one should be. And then if they're too big, I cut them down with scissors and tape them up temporarily and mock it all up. And they either have mock-ups of the artifacts or put the actual artifact in so I can decide if it needs a little pedestal to raise it up a little or not. And just, just lay the whole thing out full size. And then once I have everything the way I want it in the mock-up, then I uh, can do the final versions of the text and the final versions of the, have the photographs printed and uh, build the little pedestals and uh, do the final uh, version. Sounds like you've created a pretty good process for creating the final display. How do museum exhibits differ from other forms of communication? <laughs> I think of the museum exhibit as a, a medium of communication. There are lots of different media. There are books 
in videos, websites, magazines, so forth. The thing that the museum has that none of the rest of those have is that it gives people the opportunity to see the real thing firsthand. And although we have incredible photography today, and we even have websites where you can see things in 3D and all this kind of stuff, it's in many cases still just not as good as seeing the real artifact up close. Or in some cases, if it's something that's touchable, actually getting to to touch it and and or smell it or see it. Uh, things like minerals, for example, and this is drawing from my geology background, uh, one important way to identify minerals is their, their luster. Luster just doesn't come across <laughs> in a photograph very well. And, uh, or things like how much something weighs. You know, if you ever actually picked up a small meteorite, you know, it's amazing how much those things weigh and you just don't get that from uh, a picture in a book. Are there some general principles for designing an exhibit? There are a few that I've uh, learned over the years. Uh, one is uh, uh, try to make things so they're not too cluttered. It's good to group, have things in groups and choose odd numbers for the, the group. So a cluster of three of something or a cluster of five of something is good. I've seen displays that were done by amateurs <clears throat> where they'll have a panel and they'll put 20 photographs on the panel. And you can't take in all that. And so by having more pictures, people are actually going to see less. They would see more if they were just three or four really good pictures in that exhibit. That would communicate the information better. So that's that's one thing that I've uh, learned over the years and that I, I try to do. Um, the other thing is that once you, of course, know the rules, then you can legally break them if you want to. <laughs> Occasionally, not very often, but once in a while you are allowed to break the rules. And a good example of that is at the uh, museum that's at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles. They have, uh, for most of their exhibits, they have just a single skeleton or maybe two skeletons of the, the large animals that have been found as fossils in the tar pits. But there's one species, the dire wolf, that's the most abundant of the large animals. And they have found over the years remains of 3,600 dire wolves in the tar pits, which just shows you the incredible richness of this fossil locality. So in the exhibit there, they have a display of 400 dire wolf skulls. So that exhibit is there just to make two points. One, the richness of the deposit. And two, uh, they're each, each one is a little bit different. So people can get up real close and they can look at them and, you know, they're different ages or had different uh, maladies of different kinds. And so people can see uh, the, the amount of variation and the importance of, of variation in a species. So that's a good example of where they violated the rule, but they had a good reason to do that. It's very important that a person who's doing an exhibit have a certain amount of artistic sense. I'm very fortunate in that both of my parents were artists, so I think I inherited a good bit of their artistic uh, talent. Um, but that's, that's very important in, in, in design. If uh, somebody doesn't have that, then the exhibits are just not going to look very good. The things won't be arranged right and they won't be proportioned right. Uh, I did a display once of minerals and I worked with a, a staff person on this display. And uh, after I 
was left and the exhibit was up, then he uh, did another exhibit of minerals where he tried to copy the style that I had established with the first exhibit. And several people looked at it and said, you know, he tried to copy that style, but it just wasn't as good. So I took that as a big compliment. I apparently had had the artistic touch, and so I was very proud of that. <laughs> One of the things uh, in doing exhibits uh, that is also very important is to be flexible. And this is, uh, you can do that if you're doing a lot of the work yourself in a small museum. If you're uh, having other people do the work, the different aspects of the work, then you lose a lot of that flexibility. Uh, but I, uh, in laying out each exhibit, I have the opportunity to make last minute changes for uh, artistic reasons or some other reason. An example of that is in the current uh, here or then and now exhibit at the Capitola Museum. Uh, I discovered this, these wonderful giant letters made out of cardboard, big blocks of cardboard, uh, for sale at the local art supply store. And I'd eyed them for several years and I thought that those would be really good in uh, an exhibit. And so I was gonna use them for this exhibit and I put them in the entry display. They were, they were going to do the. They were going to be for the main title. And I painted one and I put it in the display. But I realized the lighting in that case came from up above, and it brought out all the little relief and all the little defects in those cardboard letters. And I just decided for that and several other reasons that it wasn't going to work. But one of the other displays was about the history of the, or the Capitola Theater site, what it looked like when the theater was there and what it looks like now as a parking lot. And so I thought, well, I could take those letters, buy just a few more letters, and I'd have enough to spell Capitola Theater, and I could paint them white and set them up on top of that display case as an added element to that display. And it works great. And they're up high, they don't have a spotlight on them, so you don't see the, the, the little defects, but, and people aren't that close to them. Uh, so that was a good place. So I still, it wasn't a waste of money, I still got to use the letters. And, uh, but that's a good example of uh, being flexible and uh, making some last minute uh, changes. Sometimes in working on exhibits, uh, you come across a, a snag. Uh, when you think about it, with each exhibit, you have to make hundreds, probably thousands of decisions. Every little thing you have to decide from what size type is it gonna be, what color paper are your labels gonna be printed on, how are you gonna mount them, what size every photograph is gonna be. It, it, just thousands of decisions. And once in a while you come across one that you can't decide or you can't resolve it and you get hung up and when that happens if possible it's best to just jump to some other part of the project and work on that for a day or two or three and very often the problem that you got so hung up on will resolve itself either you'll decide not to use that thing in the exhibit or in the middle of the night, you'll come up with some great solution to the problem. And uh, so you don't want to lose a lot of time agonizing o over something, because often just uh, sitting on it for a little bit, uh, you'll find the solution. Sometimes uh, people will pick odd colors for exhibits, and that can be another problem. I prefer kind of pastel or muted colors in the background so that artifacts and pictures will stand out and stand out. 
But again, there are exceptions to that. I did a historical exhibit once about a candy store, and for that we did uh, we used bright yellow and bright red in the exhibit, and for that it was uh, appropriate. I generally don't like to use white. I think white is kind of dull. White labels, you know, looks like you just did them on typing paper or something, and uh, it's good to have paper that is a little bit has a little color to it and so uh, if you were doing a hospital because of it on the history of a hospital white might be fine but generally I stay away from white do you find that many visitors read the labels it varies tremendously you know some people walk into the museum and will spend half an hour or an hour reading every single label and studying everything very carefully other people walk in the door, glance around for about 30 seconds, and walk out. <laughs> that's, that's why it's very important to uh, uh, set up a, a kind of a hierarchy for the messages, the written messages in an exhibit. Uh, you can think of the messages as being a, a primary message, and then you have a secondary message, and then you have smaller uh, labels, which I suppose you could call them tertiary messages. Um, so the the primary messages, which might be, say, the title for uh, a display, would be in the largest lettering, and then a little bit of description might be considered to be the secondary message, which would be a little bit smaller lettering, and uh, so on. Sometimes it's good to have the title of a display be a message that actually teaches something. So instead of having a display that says whales and then a secondary message that says there are ten different kinds of whales that live in the waters off of, uh, of uh, this area and whales are mammals and so forth and so on. Instead put in big letters right at the top of this, the, the display whales are mammals. So then somebody glancing at that display from 20 feet away, even if they don't look at anything else, they will at least, at least receive that message. And if they didn't know that whales are mammals, then they have learned something. Can you make a case for cases? Some things need to be in display cases and some things uh, don't. Uh, there's a tendency in a lot of museums to have things out of cases so that you don't have reflections and that they're more accessible, which is fine if it's something that uh, isn't, uh, can't be damaged by being, uh, in, uh, out, by being outside of a display case. The funny thing about display cases if you have the same object in a display case and you have the same object in a pedestal outside of a display case, if you put it in the display case, people will think it's more important. <laughs> so that's another argument for display cases. But some things clearly don't need to be in, in display cases. But it, it's very, very important to think about uh, this object is it, is it replaceable or not, and how, how easy is it to replaced. Um, some things are, are absolutely irreplaceable and so it's the per one of the jobs of the museum is to uh, try to preserve those things forever and so you have to really make sure that they are, are protected and, and won't get ruined. There are uh, there used to be a display in a museum up in the San Francisco Bay Area where they had uh, a lot of things out in the open, they, including dioramas, and they had would have little fences or barriers of some kind. And there was one diorama where there was a mounted deer, and it was just close enough to the edge of the diorama so school children uh, going to the museum on tours could lean over, reach over, and pet that deer. Well, after 20 years, there was this patch on the deer where all the fur had been worn off. And so, but when you think about it, 
you can probably get another deer specimen without too much difficulty. And just think of the thousands of school children who went home and told their parents, I got to pet the deer. And that kind of you know, positive experience uh, made it so that it, it was probably worth it to have to replace the deer every 20 years or so. How important is lighting? That's very important because light, light, if it has a lot of ultraviolet in it, will make certain things fade. And that can be very, very destructive, especially uh, ballpoint pen and stamp pad ink and, uh, and color photographs. Uh, some of those, it, they'll be ruined if they're exposed to the wrong kind of light for a long period of time. And in some cases, it can be as little as uh, six months. That's why museums don't have very much natural light coming in because that has a lot of UV in it. And then uh, lighting in the museum should uh, be lighting that doesn't produce uh, ultraviolet. If you can't get rid of the ultraviolet, then it is you can buy, uh, have display case tops, plexiglass display case tops that have a UV filter in the plexiglass. But of course, they're more expensive. So it could be cheaper just to replace the lighting. Have you done many interactive or participatory exhibits? I've done quite a few through the years. Uh, it's really nice to have a few things in a display where the, view, the visitor can do something like push a button or lift a flap or touch something. Uh, that, that's a really nice element to add to an exhibit. Uh, you have to remember that as soon as you let people touch stuff, especially children, play with stuff, uh, it's going to mean more upkeep because things are going to get broken and you have to replace them once in a while. Uh, I did one display uh, about uh, at the Capitola Museum about baseball star Harry Hooper, who lived in Capitola for many years and we were able to get a recording from his uh, acceptance speech at the Baseball Hall of Fame. So I set up a little display with a, a mock lectern and it said, you know, Baseball Hall of Fame on it. It said, push button to hear part of his acceptance speech. So people could push the button and hear just a little snippet of his speech. And that really added a, a wonderful element to the exhibit and uh, his family really like that, so, so that was uh, real nice. One time I did an exhibit for the Agricultural History Museum in Watsonville about apples, and I think there were four or five different varieties of apples that were kind of the main ones that were grown in the Pajaro Valley in the early 1900s. So I got examples of those different apples, and I made latex rubber molds of half of each apple, and then I cast them in uh, Bondo, or auto body putty, with bolts embedded in the back. Then I hired a uh, student from the science illustration program that they used to have at UCSC to paint each one uh, real, as realistically as possible, so we'd have realistic examples of each variety of apple. Then I gave them several cults coats of uh, uh, water-based polyurethane, which is they use to paint on floors, so it's practically indestructible. So I bolted these down to the exhibit, and there was a bunch of push buttons with the name of the apple, so people could try to guess, you know, which one was the Newtown Pippin, and, you know, push the Newtown Pippin button and see which, which light lit up next to the little sculpted apple and, and so play an apple guessing game. And I thought it worked uh, really well. How about participatory exhibits? Are those more of a challenge? Well, I think they are. Uh, those are more have become more popular in recent years and the idea is to get the viewers actually doing things in the exhibit, uh, have stations where they can 
build things or color things or write down things. One easy participatory exhibit to do is uh, where there's some uh, history of, of an event that's within the memory of people who are coming to see the exhibit. Uh, so I did an exhibit on the Loma Prieta earthquake and we invited people to uh, write down on a scrap of paper their earthquake memory and pin it on a, a bulletin board. Another time I did an exhibit about caves and so we invited people to uh, jot down if they had any interesting experiences in caves, hopefully not getting stuck in a cave. Uh, but yeah, people, a lot of people participated and a lot of people would stop to read what people wrote. Pe people enjoyed that. So, uh, and at the Capitola Museum for a long time, uh, we had a, a coloring station, uh, mostly for children, although some adults uh, used it as well, uh, with some uh, pictures of Capitola that people could sit down and, and color and then take home as uh, souvenirs. So that uh, worked very well. Uh, we had to cut that out when the pandemic hit, but we hope eventually to be able to bring that back. You must have seen a lot of changes in museum graphics. Yes, well I'm going to seem like a real dinosaur now. <laughs> you know, when, uh, I, when I go to museums, I look at all these things. So I'm looking at the lighting, I'm looking at the, the graphics, I, I'm, looking at, I'm looking for ideas. Uh, and I remember uh, quite a few years ago, I visited the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And in their Hall of Fossil Mammals, that hall, this was in the late 80s, that hall had not been touched since the 1920s. So it was really fun to see basically a museum of a museum, right? You see, this is how they've since redone it all, but you could see this is how they did exhibits in the 1920s. This is what they thought was state of the art. And at that time, uh, they had hardly any graphics. They just have a, a little label of what it was. Uh, you know, fossil mastodon or something. And you could tell that somebody had taken a pen, dipped it in India ink, and hand-lettered that label. So that's kind of the beginning of museum graphics. Uh, in the middle 1900s, there was something called Leroy lettering, which I actually, the first exhibit I ever did in about 1972 or so, the curator set me up with some Leroy lettering that he had had from when he was younger. And it, uh, you, it kind of works like a pantograph. <clears throat> you have this template with each letter, and you have this thing that has uh, a pen that's attached to it. <clears throat> so you can follow the outline of the letter with part of it, and it will print the letter onto the, the paper with the India ink and then you slide it over and do the next letter. It's very laborious, because you don't have to do it one letter at a time, but it does make mechanically perfect lettering. Then later on, I use the uh, what's called rub-off letters or transfer lettering, but again, you have to apply it one letter at a time. Um, I still use that or used to use that for making relief maps because you're putting lettering on a curved, bumpy surface, so I, I could, I did have to do it one letter at a time. In the early 1980s, the curator of the museum that I was working at wanted me to learn how to do uh, silkscreen printing. That was state of the art at that time. So I learned how to do that. Uh, it's a uh, again extinct pretty much now but uh, but that was that was wonderful because you could go to a photo typesetter have them typeset all the texts perfectly and then you transfer that lettering to a, a screen that has a photo emulsion on it then you lay it down on the panel that you want to print on and you take your ink and your squeegee and you you print all that lettering and uh, after four or five attempts, <laughs> you can get it to come out just right. It, it's very uh, 
fussy. And sometimes it worked great, sometimes I'd have, have to make several attempts, and so it would get very frustrating and annoying. But it did produce beautiful, beautiful uh, graphics, and you could print on wood, and you could print on directly on the plexiglass, and you could do a lot of uh, fun th in, in any color, any typeface. So a lot of flexibility works worked really well. Now, of course, most people use personal computers and uh, lay it all out on the computer screen and then either print it out on a large printer or on a smaller printer and um, do it that way. Some people will lay out a panel and do it all on one as one graphic, one sheet. So they'll put the photographs on it and the text and everything. And there are certain things you can do graphically with overlays and backgrounds that you can only <clears throat> you can only do that if you're if you're doing a, a single panel. And those are wonderful for outdoor uh, displays in parks. Uh, you can have them done in a high pressure of laminate, so they're practically indestructible, and they pretty much just have to be flat. But the exhibits that I do, I like to uh, do each element of the exhibit printed separately. So the photograph is one thing, the labels are separate, the text is separate. And the reason why is you can block things out and give create more of a three-dimensional effect. And also, if you make a mistake <laughs> on, say, a, one label, you don't have to print out the whole thing. You can just replace that one label. So anyway, those are just a few tips that uh, I can offer people who work in uh, small museums. And I hope that people out there will uh, find those tips uh, helpful. Well, thank you for sharing some of those tips with us today, and I am sure that people will find them very interesting. Capitola, come to the coast with me. The sun and the sky are free. We'll play in the sand and sea. Capitola, paradise you'll adore. I'll take your hand there on the sand along the shore. Capitola, over the bridge we'll go. We'll capture the sunset glow and wait for the creek to flow. Capitola, sway to the ocean's roar. Beside the strand we'll hear the band down by the shore. Capitola.